Okay, we're, we're, you're, you're welcome back. Uh, it's still the run-up, and I still have Bayro standing by here. We're going to talk about a lot of things uh, that made the news and which are connected in some way to the 2023 election, beginning from uh, uh, the bullion vans that went into Bodilon, uh, that the said missed the address and went into Bodilon, Tinubu's house. The Lagos State Organizing Secretary of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Ayodele Adewali, has claimed that the bullion van spotted uh, the residents of Ashiwaju Bola, Tinubu's, uh, on the eve of uh, the 2019 presidential election, missed their way. According to him, the bullion van uh, uh, had been put to rest. The bullion van matter had been put to rest a long time ago, and he said there was no money in the bullion van. Remember, Bayo, that um, it was said that uh, Ashiwaju himself said the bullion van, uh, redesigning of the Naira, and so many other things happening right now are targeted at him. Now we heard, heard that the, uh, a chieftain of the APC said that the bullion van missed its, its way to Bodilon, and that has been put to rest. I don't know what your take on that is. What would you, be your response to that? Well, um, I would have loved to know the context uh, in which the APC chieftain uh, made that statement. The reason is because if, the, if it, there was a question posed to him uh, and then he was responding, which I assume, uh, then maybe uh, it's understandable. Understandable in the sense that from a public communication point of view, I don't think the APC should have gone to revisit the issue of the bullion ban because um, it was something that is rather embarrassing. Uh, and also, if what was attributed to Ashwaji himself uh, after that incident was, was true, you know, because I think some sections of the media reported that he said he could put his money anywhere he wanted. Uh, I don't know if that was true. But if it was... Uh, and then now, to now say the bullion van missed their way, uh, I think it's just bringing back the matter into public consciousness. And I assume that the APC would rather that this matter never came back into public consciousness. But they have put it right back into public consciousness. And it's going to be an issue people will start talking about. I mean, right now we are talking about it on the program because people are already talking about it. So um, it, it's the first time I'm hearing that the bullion van missed its way, you know. Uh, <laughs> I assume that bullion vans would know specifically where they were headed, given the kind of consignment or the kind of cargo that they normally would carry. Uh, so having said that much, uh, bringing back the matter is just reopening, if you like, reopening old wounds. Uh, and of course, this is a political season. Uh, the, the adversaries, political adversaries uh, of Ashiwaju would latch onto this and would, of course, try to make a mountain out of it uh, and keep it in the public eye. You know, so I, I think it's um, rather untoward that, that this matter has come up again for the APC. Yeah. I, well, the, the question was, um, you know, it, it stemmed from vote buying and so many other things re, um, surrounding that and how money is being spent during elections and all that. And, but I wasn't even worried because, like he said, the bullion va van matter uh, has been laid to rest. Not really that it has been laid to rest, but we've heard over and over again and if we have been angry, we've been angry for so long that we have forgotten how to be angry about it anymore. But what worried me, that a new perspective I had about it is, <clears throat> if a publicity secretary or any kind of secretary for that matter, or any kind of spokesman for that matter, will come out, even if you need to lie, you know, there are ways to go about it that someone will still be comfortable that I know it is not the truth, but at least you're diplomatic enough. Uh, so the question I was asking myself is, is it not high time that people in government, people in power, people that matter, people that, have, uh, that are the VIPs in our society, start thinking about who represents them? Like 
publicists, professionals who can talk for them, know what to say, choose their words rightly. Because it's like that aspect of their lives or the lives of a lot of big men in quote in Nigeria has been taken for granted that anybody can talk for you. And they keep making the blunders that they make all the time. Or how can you, in all honesty, trying to defend something and you say a bullion van on the one hand were, had missed its way, on the other hand, it was empty. How did you know <laughs> that it was empty? Will, will a bullion van that just missed its way to your house, for instance, just come and open its, um, open its bowels and show you that it's not carrying money? How did he even know about it? <clears throat> so what worried me is the fact that people who are public figures allow just anybody to represent them and talk for them. And it becomes a worrisome thing because in every clime, among all kinds of people, there are always maybe some blunders that their principals have made, but at least they manage this because poor management of it not only damages the reputation or the, the picture of his principal, but it also affects a lot of other people who either follow or look up to him or, and so many other things are surrounding that poor representation as it is. So shouldn't they start to look critically at the functions of publicists and people who are professional enough to represent them? Should we continue like this and they be taking it for granted all the time? That's what gave me worry, Bio. I, I don't know. No, you're spot on. Um, there, there are quite a number of issues, you know, uh, related to the point you just made. Um, the first is that there are levels of authority when it comes to public communication. I mean, for all responsible organizations, you have your designated spokespersons, and below or outside of those spokespersons, certain other officials can speak, okay? Uh, it's just that they will need to know what they can speak about. Yeah. You know, and what they need to refer to, uh, may, maybe somebody higher up, or the right person who is designated to handle all public engagement and public interaction. Uh, the second thing is that uh, principal figures, if you allow me to use that phrase, principal figures now, I use it to refer to anyone who is in authority and, and will be expected to make statements, okay? Like governors, like uh, presidents, like um, CEO of companies, yeah. uh, local government chairpersons, and so on and so forth. These principal figures, oftentimes, especially uh, in, in an environment where public communication is not well structured, they want to speak about all and everything, you know, um, and it, it, they, sh they, they should not actually speak about everything. Mm. Um, if I give you an example, the Nigerian Railway Corporation uh, has been, was in the news some time ago when the attack on the train, the Abuja Kaduna train, you know, uh, when that attack took place. And the official who was speaking for the Nigerian Railway Corporation was the managing director himself. And I kept asking myself, don't they have a public relations manager or a public communications person in the Nigerian railways? Because most of the comments that the CEO of the NRC was making were just unbelievable. Hmm. Unbelievable. And it, it, it links to what you just said about perhaps the nonchalance of public figures or principal figures as to what they say to people. You know, uh, even what they say now, forgetting that what you say now may be quoted five years from now or yeah. may be quoted ten years from now, yeah. Yeah. which makes it absolutely necessary for you to have some structure in place. You know, the gentleman could have easily said, I am not competent to speak on that matter. Of course. Or I will refer this issue to the competent person and you'll be hearing from us on that. And you buy time and you reflect, and then you respond, mm. you know. So not just them, it's something which I have seen is endemic around us, you know. That's why I cited the example of the Nigerian railways. But it's very important that there should be structure uh, for public communication and public interaction. 
Yeah, very right. Because sometimes you hear some, some things that are being said. And the first question is that, did the handlers, that's the word that they use, did the handlers not think about this? They should have known better so that he would, wouldn't have to do this or to say this. And so the next president that we're going to have, next governors, next uh, houses of representatives and house of representatives rather members and uh, senators, whoever is in the public glare that will be, will be saying things, policy statements and so many other things that affect our lives should not take this department as it were to, uh, for granted because statements that are made, like you said, they will endure sometimes more, longer than you have to stay on this earth. There are some people we still quote today that have gone long before we, even we were born. But those statements have stood the test of time. They better be the right ones. And so, like we're saying, don't take that for granted. So if you're going to be my president tomorrow or my governor tomorrow, let the utterances be well thought out so that when they are, when they are delivered, it will give me some kind of consolation, even if I'm not getting satisfied uh, in whatever I'm asking for. At least, let the professionals help. Okay, well, let's not, let's not talk about that because some people might even misunderstand it and say, okay, they're asking for people to come to broadcasters and take them. We're not necessarily the, <laughs> the publicists. We're not necessarily the publicists. But if you find someone who is intelligent enough, who is... Um, yeah, who can put the right words in the right context for people to hear. It will be good to employ that kind of a person. Like my, one of my lecturers used to say, meanings are in people, not in words. But since you cannot... Yeah. And, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. And, and, and the truth is, if, you're, if you are running for public office, or even if you are, I mean, depending on what might have happened in the organization, you know, you basically have to first of all look at all the potential negative things yeah. that have happened. List them out. Reflect on them all. Develop answers. Okay, we call them reactive lines. You develop reactive lines. And those reactive lines are distributed to all those who may meet the press mm. and may have to speak so that you are all saying the same thing. So if somebody asks us a question about the run-up as a program, what I am going to say to that person, and what you, Yangu, will say to that person, or what Uche will say to that person, is going to be consistent because we've reflected and we've come up with a reactive line. Mm. You know, so they need to look at all the reactive lines. You know, when, for instance, the example I cited before, the MD of the Nigerian Railway Corporation, when they asked him, the intelligence services reportedly told you not to run the train service in the night, in the late evening. He admitted that the intelligence services told them not to do that. But guess what his answer was? They said, now why did you run the service? He said, do you want to deprive Nigerians of the opportunity of benefiting from the train service? Hmm. That was preposterous. I mean, people had been abducted because you ran the train service. So I'm sorry to, to cite that. I'm without prejudice to the, to the Nigerian Railway Corporation. I'm just using this as an example to, yeah, to illustrate yeah. our point that public communication is a very serious thing, you know, uh, and more so in the political environment. So it's always good to do the proper checks and develop the proper reactive minds before people engage uh, with the public. Okay, well, uh, there seems to be a battle uh, against independent monetary policy. The CBN... Uh, and the House of Reps right now, are, I don't know, is it a battle? Well, but the House of Reps has threatened that they are going to maybe issue a warrant of arrest for the CBN governor because there appear to be a raging battle against the independence of the, uh, uh, of the Central Bank of Nigeria. Now, he has been invited several times, uh, as we hear, and he has not appeared before the, the House. And they're now threatening that he will be arrested if he fails to do so. Now, the issue is whether uh, he will bend to whatever they are saying. Uh, they are saying that he should extend the date for the 
uh, exchange of Naira notes, how do I even put it? Gadu de Mefele is insisting that the January 31 deadline for facing out the old 200, 500, and 1,000 Naira banknotes would not be altered. And the CBN has operational and monetary policy independence. But the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Honorable, Honorable Femi Bajabia Mila, threatened to invoke relevant sections of the law to issue a warrant of arrest on MFLA and bank chief executive officers should they refuse to appear before its ad hoc committee that was set up to interrogate the central bank and the CEOs on the Naira redesign project and the January 31 deadline. But Jabir Amila insisted that the CBN must heed the call of Nigerians and allow the old banknotes to remain in use alongside the newly redesigned currencies so as not to jeopardize the economy uh, and impoverish the people. And I'm just wondering, where do we draw the line uh, between independence of an agency and um, what the House of Reps is trying to make to look like the general good of the people. Like Nigerians, according to them, are complaining that they should extend the, the deadline to maybe June or so, and the CBN governor must appear, otherwise he will be arrested. Now, where does the independence of an agency start and stop? Because I don't know if the Central Bank of Nigeria is independent, to what extent is it independent? Can it take its own decisions and not have the interference of the House of Reps or the General National Assembly? Uh, where am I getting it wrong here, or confused, rather? No, I don't think you're getting it wrong. I think this is a matter of public interest, especially since the National Assembly itself, um, which is... Uh, in, in the presidential system that we operate, we have three tiers of, we have uh, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary. And they are all autonomous. The National Assembly even have a National Assembly Service Commission. But the few staff who work for the National Assembly, okay, they are not under the Federal Civil Service. They are independent. Even their own staff have their own National Assembly Service Commission. That is to underscore the independence of the National Assembly. Having said that, the National Assembly does have oversight uh, uh, responsibilities. But I believe strongly that the oversight responsibility of the National Assembly also has some technical limitations. If I use defense, for example, if the defense committee of the National Assembly summons the uh, say the chief of the air staff and the chief of the air because the chief of the air staff for example says the air force has chosen to acquire a particular kind of fighter aircraft and the committee of the national assembly calls the chief of air staff and says you cannot acquire that kind of aircraft you have to acquire another type of aircraft right in the wisdom of the of the of a service, a very technical service like the Air Force. They know what they want. They know why they are going for that, right? So there would have there, there would have to be some sort of respect, you know, as long as all the, the transparency, uh, you know, um, and other checks, you know, in, in terms of acquisition of uh, of equipment and all that have been followed. I think the National Assembly would have to respect a technical decision. Now, I'm using that example, and I hope it's not complicated, because the central bank is autonomous, and the central bank has a uh, right to monetary policy, monetary policy, sorry, monet yeah, monetary policy, while the federal government and the Ministry of Finance has control over fiscal policy. Now, I have never heard that the chairman of the Federal Reserve in the US, which is the equivalent of our own central bank, when he decides to fix interest rates, I've never heard that the US Congress will summon the chairman of the Federal Reserve and tell him when to fix interest rates or what percentage to fix as interest rates. So if you would not challenge that, I don't see why you would challenge a policy which is clearly within the purview of the central bank. Uh, and the, the issue of summoning people to appear before the National Assembly, 
is well within the rights of parliament because parliament makes laws for the good governance of Nigeria. You know, but I have I know that there was a controversy some years ago when the National Assembly summoned the Controller General of Customs, Colonel Ali, if, if I'm right, I think it's Colonel Ali, yeah, yeah the current control, the retired Colonel, Controller General of Customs, because there was a ban imposed on the importation of used cars. And he was summoned to the National Assembly. Okay. He, he said, I think there, there was some disagreement between them as to when he was supposed to appear. And when he, he did appear, they, they decided he should go back and put on the customs uniform before. Yeah. I remember this. Appearing before them. Yeah. And he never went back before the National Assembly. And then there were, I remember Professor Ishe Sagi, a well known constitutional expert, came up and spoke about analyzed the, 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 the obligation of those who were summoned to appear before the... And, and it's not even summoning. I don't think the word is even summoning. And from what prayers of cycle, you can invite somebody to help you better understand, mm. you know, the policies that have been made or the policies you want to make. So these issues came up and there was a lot of debate. So we are seeing something similar now. Uh, definitely, I think the National Assembly has the right to invite the central bank governor. But I think the word and the spirit and letter of that invitation mm. has to be civil uh, and cannot be threatening. Because like you rightly said, the central bank is autonomous. Yeah. And that autonomy has been in existence up until now. This is the first time I'm seeing this autonomy being seriously challenged. Under President Obasanjo, when the autonomy began, the governor was Soludo. Was governor, I think it was the first CPN governor to gain that autonomy. And, and we've seen it, you know, uh, go on. Even Emei Fiede, who is there now, was appointed by President Jonathan. And President Gwari respected that autonomy. He didn't touch Emei Fiede. He inherited Emei Fiede. So I think we need not undermine the independence of our institutions, you know, while doing our constitutional duty. Yeah, I, I was also wondering, if, if they have an ad hoc uh, committee that has to oversee this, why invite the, well, maybe I, I, I'm wrong, but why, why not the ad hoc committee, as part of its oversight functions or something, go to the Central Bank of Nigeria governors to seek uh, uh, more explanation, to report back to the House? Is, will it take anything from them? Will it take the, the VIP from them? Will it take out anything from their being the National Assembly? Because you have a group that should talk about these things. And there's something that is not clear to the House. If the House goes to the Central Bank of Nigeria, does that mean it is belittling themselves or belittling the House? I don't understand why the Central Bank of Nigeria governor will have to come to the National Assembly to face an ad hoc committee in the National Assembly. It has to be in the National Assembly. I don't understand that much. But like my people say, when, when a, a small boy begins to talk anyhow to an elder, watch the corners maybe there's another elder that is pushing him so he's strong because of the strength that he's finding from somewhere that you may not be able to see but in this case we seem to see that elder that might be pushing mfla that will be explained in this video that we have of the president himself talking about the changing or the redesigning of these new notes and the deadline for the uh, facing out of the other Old notes. Let's just watch a bit. Uh, this change of, of currency, I think uh, there will be people a lot of money. But time has been given from October to December, three months. It's enough, whatever money you have, to get it changed through a legal system. So I don't know why people are complaining about it. So despite the complaint, there's no going back on the policy? No, no, there's no going back. There's no going back. My aim is to make sure that Nigerians believe that we respect them as an administration. So Nigerians should vote for whoever they like from whichever party. Nobody will be allowed to mobilize resources and thugs to intimidate people in any constituency. That's what I want to go down into Nigerian history for as a leader. You are the chairman of the presidential campaign council of your yes. party. What are the chances of your party winning the elections? What are the chances of my party not winning the election? 
We are going to this election. Tinubu, uh, the presidential candidate, is a very well-known politician in the country. He was a two times governor in, in the state, Lagos. Uh, Resource-wise, the most uh, uh, resourceful state and the most visited state. Uh, uh, so I, I think uh, the party was uh, lucky to, to get him accept, you know, to be uh, its candidate. So how healthy is my president? I'm very healthy. Okay, uh, well, you saw that. Uh, the president said the time was enough. Three months was enough. From October till now, the time was enough. And immediately after saying that, there wasn't any lapse in the, in the video. He just said... Um, he doesn't want he, he doesn't want anybody to be able to mobilize resources and thugs to do what they are not supposed to do. He wants Nigerians to vote. So now it gives us a clear picture why they redesign in the first place and the legacy that the president wants to be quit when he leaves office in May 2029. Uh, on May 29, 2023. So, time is long enough. Nobody should be able to mobilize resources and thoughts to destabilize the election or to, to win the election because of the resources and talks and all that. So, it gives us a picture, like I said, why all this is really happening. So, maybe that's why MFLA is strong enough to do what he is doing right now added to the fact that the autonomy of the Central Bank of Nigeria should be respected. So if the president himself respects it, then why not the National Assembly? Absolutely. And um, the, the CBN governor is autonomous. He heads an autonomous institution. Mm. But nonetheless, he has to keep the president apprised of some of the policies of such an autonomous institution especially where those resources, those policies may have an implication, uh, uh, you know, especially on national security. Uh, there are two things we should not forget. One, there has been a, an ongoing policy, if, I, if I'm correct, and, and I, indeed I stand to be corrected, uh, uh, called the cashless policy yeah. introduced by the CBN, yes. you know, which limits the amount of cash people can carry with them. And it was that policy that actually saw to the proliferation of the ATMs uh, and uh, a high, high commission on people who go and withdraw cash. So the, the cashless policy is not new. It's been there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what has happened now is, of course, they're redesigning. And then people have been told that if you had money outside of the system, you need to go and bring it back. And when the CBN gave figures as to how much they estimate is actually out there and how what percentage of that money that is out there is actually within the banking system. I really didn't see people disagreeing with the CBN. I didn't see, and, and there was a, a, a huge amount of money outside of the banking system. And we could see when the CBN insisted that it was not going to change the date. We all saw various videos, some we, we could not confirm, but we saw various videos circulating of huge stacks of cash that people were moving around or even moving into the banks in order for them to change them. We even saw some Naira notes that had been destroyed, allegedly destroyed by termites and other things because of where they were stored. So this goes to confirm that indeed the policy that the CBN has introduced does have some merit. Now, if I'm, if I'm also correct, and I, again, I stand to be corrected, it would appear as if when there was a, a hue and cry as to the deadline for people to, oh, sorry, the limits that people could withdraw. Yeah. I, because there was a corresponding policy that said you couldn't withdraw more than this amount of money for an individual or for a corporate body. And we saw that the CBN modified its stance and increased the amount of money that corporate bodies and individuals could withdraw. So what else does the National Assembly want the CBN to do? If, this, if the National Assembly would want to, the CBN to pander to what it wants simply because it's, it is representing the people, 
The National Assembly is not the only one that is representing the people. The president and the governors were also elected by the people. Mm. So, and that's why the constitution made it pretty clear that their functions have to be separate. So I feel that there could be, of course, and don't get me wrong, there could be good reasons, you know, for what the National Assembly is, is, is asking for. But I think the tone and language has to show respect. If any agency didn't show respect to the National Assembly, I can imagine how the National Assembly will react. So the tone and language of the National Assembly has to be carefully chosen. Because the National Assembly itself is not above the law. We are just talking about spokespersons and so on, and what they say and how they act. Mm. The National Assembly also has to, more, it has to be careful about not only how it acts, but the way it is being perceived. Yeah. That is absolutely important. Okay, well, um, let's move on now. What there is left to do is uh, for the central bank to just make the money available because a lot of banks, their ATMs are not working because they say the new uh, Naira notes are not there. And I have not seen a, an ATM that is dispensing 200 Naira notes. Someone said uh, he has seen and he actually collected. But 200 Naira is very critical to the day-to-day -day transactions of businesses in Nigeria. So if that cannot be dispensed, and not a lot of people of this, of this cadre that trade on the streets and everywhere will go to the bank, uh, banking hall to go and withdraw a lot of money that they will be given this uh, money, uh, 200 Naira notes. So the central bank should look for a way. In fact, this morning, somebody went to uh, withdraw money from POS. And by the way, the banks that are still operating their uh, ATMs are still paying old no notes and the POS operators are also paying old notes. Now this guy was said, was told... Some, some, of, some of the banks, because you said the banks. Yes, yeah, some, some of the banks. Yeah, some of you. the banks. Because not all of them. <laughs> Thank you very much. But I've seen one bank that has an ATM that has new notes and the other one has old notes. So if you are withdrawing from, say, ATM A is old notes, ATM B is new notes. But that's matter for another day. <laughs> the thing now is, this guy went to collect 5,000 Naira from the POS. And normally, it, it attracts uh, 100 Naira for the charges. Now, this POS operator said, and I quote, Now, now 200 Naira for 5,000. Because now around 2 a.m. where I buy money yesterday. Now, that statement, <laughs> for me, I don't know how to make of it. She had to buy money at 2 a.m. I was asking myself, from who? And why did it have to be at that late hour? Because if that was the case, then it wasn't from a bank. So who are the people who are now trading money for the POS people to be able to have the money to serve the people? And then there was one bag for one side for the new notes and the other side for the old notes. She will collect the old, new notes and keep and give you old notes because you are going to spend it. I got confused. I got, I got, I, I don't know the feeling that I had. But that's the new reality now. From this POS, I don't know everywhere else in Lagos, but from this POS and the area around, it is 200 Naira for a thousand, uh, for the 5,000 Naira or anything that you're collecting because money is now scarce. That's the language. So I don't know what the CBN can do about that. I don't know whether we have something that we can do about that. Who do we report to the CBN? How do we report that to the CBN? And how do they catch the people who are hoarding the money and selling the money and making the other people who are trying to exchange the same money that we're talking about to be more costly? Because someone was paying in and instead of giving a commission of 100 Naira, 200 was collected. Someone was receiving, and instead of paying a commission of 100 Naira, 200 Naira was collected. So you see how complicated this whole issue is, Bayer. It is complicated. And um, I mean, we were just also at the top of the program talking about public communication. Mm -hmm. The CBN has to be uh, concerned about not only the reality of what is existing, but also the perception, you know, uh, that people have. Um, the, the issue of the market women and the market men 
Because we often say market women. There are also men in yes. the markets. You know, but the issue of those who, who, who operate in markets, you know, has been brought onto this program. You remember we had a guest who highlighted the challenge that people in the markets would have. Yeah. And then people in rural areas, because he said the moment the, 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 the ATMs were be, being introduced on a large scale, a lot of banks started closing down branches in rural areas. Mm. Now, and then, of course, they are having network problems usually uh, in, the, so in most of these rural areas. So he made a very strong case. And this was, this was an edition of the program that we had maybe six weeks ago or, or something like that. And I would have expected the CBN to have, uh, you know, taken such comments, such feedback very seriously uh, and to have taken moves to do something about it. And if these were issues, for example, that the National Assembly highlighted and in, in civil language, I think it will have a lot of sympathy. Yeah. But when it adopts a language, you know, which is imperial, you know, and given the fact that everybody in the National Assembly is a politician, yeah. and this is an election year, and we have had notable political figures expressing apprehension about their inability to have access to cash, you see, it, it, it begins to suggest that the concern of the National Assembly may not just be for the good of Nigerians, yeah. but only in their interest as politicians. Mm -hmm. And that's why I said that the National Assembly has to be careful about perception and ensure that where it has very good reasons, you know, it presents it in a way that is very clear and everybody sees that it's doing that for the people and not because, you know, they are our representatives who are all standing for elections. So, but this is a complicated issue, like you said, and uh, one would expect that those who manage public information for the central bank should be responding to all this. You know, they cannot keep quiet, you know, because, um, they, you know, most of the time, people don't test the law. We had a student who, who, sued, who sued ASU during the strike, and that would have been an interesting case had it not been that the strike was called off just a few weeks after that. You know, once, once people are pushed, we are going to begin to see citizens rising legally and peacefully challenging what is not in their interest. You know, so the CBN and all agencies and all arms of government have to be responsive and responsible, you know, in how they go about carrying out their lawful duty. Um, well put. There are so many other things that we are going to uh, talk about. Uh, security is there and so many others. But we'll, let's just take a short break. And when we return, we'll begin with uh, tension in Nasarawa State as Governor Sule holds meeting with security agencies and Mayeti Allah. Stay with us. <laughs> 